be sing seated. <laughs> I started to say you may be singing. No, uh, you were singing, and I appreciate that. And now it's time to relax and go to sleep because Pastor Spencer is about to preach. <laughs> Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, what a delight it is to know that since we have been redeemed, we can glory in our Savior's name. The marvelous names of God, the one who is our Redeemer, our Savior. How we thank you for his grace and for the opportunity we have to study his word, the written word of the living word. We pray, Father, that you will bless our service tonight that you will grant us understanding so that we might do our Savior's will. That we might not be petty and insisting on our own ways and doing the things that we've decided we're going to do, but that we might learn from your word and from what takes place in the life of the Apostle Peter as he is called in for a confrontation, a very difficult confrontation, with a very difficult group of people to know how we can best learn to respond in a way that glorifies Christ. Every situation of life handled to the glory of God, every family circumstance, every circumstance at work, every circumstance that we find ourselves in, perhaps in interpersonal relationships with family and friends in the church as we are before the world how we should act how we should live because we belong to Christ and so father we pray for your blessings upon this time tonight for we pray it in Jesus name amen Last week we finished up our series on circumcision and food fights. We'll be picking up a few things tonight, but uh, we want to move on to a systematic exposition and witness. As we look here at Acts chapter 11 and verses 4 through 18, we discover that Peter, now that he has had a great spiritual victory, is suddenly going to be confronted by people who do not like what he did. Life is full of experiences like that, where we are raised to a, a great height and it seems so exciting and wonderful what God is doing, and suddenly someone comes along and pokes our balloon with a pin. But Peter has learned by now how to respond. Oh, he's going to have some problems a little bit later on, and we've already talked about that with the Apostle Paul having to rebuke him at one point. But Peter is on the right track. He's learning how to respond when the pressure is there. How to speak in a way that recounts what God is doing, how it is in fulfillment of the word of God, and why we as mere human beings cannot stand in the way of God's sovereignty. Those are going to be the lessons that we learn by the time we get to the end of chapter 11 and tonight especially in verses 4 through 18. But I want to pick it up in the first three verses just reading those quickly and summarizing what we have seen because it sets the stage for why Peter responds as he does. Paul later expounds in great detail in the book of Romans and in 1 Corinthians and in Galatians and several other places in the New Testament, expounds the principles underlying what Peter did, but Peter is on the spot and has to put them into practice when he stands before the council. The apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. And last week we saw the third part of our series on circumcision and food fights, the business of kosher food and eating with Gentiles. 
Our cross-reference text was Romans chapter 14, which dealt specifically with questionable foods and with the conscience, which is what is happening in verse 3. There are some people who have been offended by what Peter did. It appears that these are people who have had their conscience trampled on. Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. And then we saw how Paul, under the control of the Holy Spirit, gave the underlying principles that control this situation and many others as well. We talked about how these are principles that, although they have specific illustrations used in each case, are general principles by the time Paul gets to the end of discussing, and by the way, this is a very important thing to understand when you're reading Paul's epistles. One of the ways in which Paul writes is he takes specific instances and illustrations, he goes through them, breaks them down, and then ends the passage with a general principle, a principle of general applicability, if you will, that will apply to every type of circumstance that has any reflection on what he has just spoken about. Very important to learn. It helps you understand the book of Romans. It helps you understand First and Second Corinthians. It helps you understand Galatians. Now, when we get to Ephesians, there's, there's a different breakdown. The first three chapters, he's uh, talking doctrinal truth. The last three chapters, he's talking practical application. But as you read the epistles of Paul, especially those that I've mentioned, you will discover that Paul gives illustrations which he then concludes with a generalized principle which applies to many different areas of the Christian life. It will help in your study of the New Testament. But Paul used a test case. You recall it was vegetarianism. And he talked about those that are weak in the faith receive you but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. And then he drew some interesting principles. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. That would go a long way, that final principle there, in resolving church fights. We are so quick to judge on what I have called the adiaphorous issues the things that are neither moral nor immoral in and of themselves. Now, there are statements in Scripture concerning things that are right and wrong. That's not what Paul is giving as a principle here. Well, you know, I know it says right or I know it's wrong, but don't judge anybody else because, after all, you know, we just can't judge anybody else. Um, that's not what he's saying. He's saying when you come across an issue, and we all fight about those things in church, when you come across an issue that is neither moral nor immoral, right or wrong, righteous nor unrighteous, it's a thing which in its context, remember that, in its context is neutral, then cut them some slack. We tend as fundamentalists, and I count myself as a fundamentalist, we tend not to apply that, but to apply the dogmatic principles of right and wrong to things which fall into neutral areas. The reason for each choice will be judged by God. Why are you doing what you are doing? Verses 10 through 12, Paul says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ plums not merely the surface, but he plums the depth of what we do and why we do it. He knows the reasons. He knows the motivations. He knows the fears or the desire for obedience. He knows whether or not we're compromising just to get by or whether or not we are standing for the truth of Scripture. Why do you do what you do? That is most important to God. Oh, what you do is important, but why you're doing what you're doing is important too, because it can look right on the surface and be totally wrong in the eyes of God. 
For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. All of us, individually, personally, nobody else standing around that we can hide behind, nobody else we can blame, nobody else where we can get an excuse, like Adam tried to do when he said, the woman that thou gavest me. <laughs> no, Adam was accountable. Pastors have an even greater responsibility because I will also have to give an account for every one of you. That will not be pleasant. In some cases it will be very joyful, but in other cases I am not looking forward to having given account for people who have been under my care in various ministries over the last 40 years. The prohibition against judging your brother applies only to the neutral things. In other cases, which are moral and immoral, we are commanded to judge. I think I read to you last week the passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where Paul tells us seven times, seven times in five verses, that we are required to judge. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye not unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? And of course, chapter 5, he gives the illustration of the man who is living in an incestuous relationship with his father's wife. And he says, I have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are gathered together, it wasn't just Paul making the judgment, that was corporate public church judgment that was going on. When you are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan. For what have I to judge them that are also without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. We also looked at the second issue was the issue of Sabbatarianism. And we saw from Romans 14, 5 through 8, that that is a non-issue. And from those verses, we saw Paul adding several additional principles. The first issue was the issue of the conscience, which we covered in great detail last week. And a man should not violate his conscience. That's a major issue in the New Testament. That's why the understanding of circumcision and kosher foods and the solution in Acts 11 is so important because... Everything that goes on around us is somehow going to be affecting our conscience personally. And what we do will affect the consciences of weaker brothers. And that's why we looked at Romans 14, because those are the, the statements of the principles using those two illustrations out of the book of Acts that lay the principles down for us. And herein I do exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. That should be our goal. That's Paul speaking, Acts chapter 24, verse 16. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not my conscience, also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. He hadn't stuffed it. He hadn't crushed his conscience. He hadn't seared his conscience. His conscience was clear before God, and he had the testimony, the witness of the Spirit of God saying so. I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience. Do you serve God with a pure conscience? Well, we read many other passages out of 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Titus chapter 1, verse 15. We saw how many times Paul speaks to Timothy about having a clear conscience in that very short epistle of 1 Timothy, and we read you a few of those. And then we concluded with, well, what about if you have already defiled your conscience? Hebrews 9.14 How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself 
without spot to God, purge your conscience. So if we leave out that middle phrase, which is an explanation, and just take the first and last phrases, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Did you know that you will have a very difficult time serving God if your conscience has not been cleansed by the blood of Christ? We all believe, we all understand that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. But you will discover that even though you know that in your head, you've had a damaged conscience because of sin in the past. How much more shall the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It's not merely, I've had my sins forgiven and therefore I can move right ahead and I can do whatever I want. No, it cleanses your conscience from dead works. Those works of the flesh, those things of the past, the things that used to be your habits, the things that you used to indulge in, that you enjoyed so much, and you had your sins forgiven. Don't fall back into the old ways. Don't say, as Paul warns us against, what, let us sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? What's still holding you back from service? Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You see, the goal of the Christian life is not to be saved and to sit but to be saved and to serve. To serve the living God. Someday we'll give an account for the service that we have given. Some are called at the earliest morning hour, others at noon, others an hour before sunset. But all are called to serve. Your conscience has a great deal to do with how you will serve. Peter tells us, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Do you have a good conscience that you have lived a life that pleased Christ? Are people accusing you because it's true? Or can you with a good conscience say, I know that's not true. I have a good conscience before God. So that brings us to verses 4 through 18 tonight. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. Now, I want you to notice Peter started at the beginning. He didn't just start at the end. Now, when he ends, by the time he ends, they're going to agree with him. But it says... He rehearsed the matter from the beginning. When you're challenged, start at the beginning. Too many people skip and jump and hop around and you have no idea what they are talking about. <laughs> Your people. A lot of us are like that. We want to rush and get to the conclusion first. You know, we all have by being a part of this particular denomination, taken upon ourselves the design of working for the peace and purity of the church. It's in the ordination vows, it's in the membership vows, it's in all kinds of things in the Bible Presbyterian denomination, the peace and purity of the church. By the time we get to the end of verse 18, we're going to discover that Peter, by what he says, has accomplished the peace and the purity of the church. There's been agitation, there has been argumentation, there has been doctrinal difference, there has been a thought that Peter has gone askance in his Christian life and practice. 
How does he deal with it? He starts from the beginning. And then he doesn't hop around, it says. He expounded it by order unto them. This is part one of systematic exposition and witness. That sets the stage for what Peter's going to say. And as we go through these verses, we will discover the same principles that we have been looking at as we looked at Paul in Romans chapter 14 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He begins in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descended as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowl of the air. Now you can imagine that some of Peter's adversaries at this point are saying, So what is this got to do with anything? You went amongst the Gentiles and you ate the food with them. Peter is giving them the historical background for what happened. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. And the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. Peter has remained kosher at this point. He didn't actually arise and kill and eat anything that was in the sheet. The voice came three times, Peter resisted it, and so God pulled the whole sheet back up into heaven. So they're listening with approval at this point. They're saying, okay, okay. He did not eat any unclean food out of that sheet that came down from heaven. They were fixing a meal downstairs and it would have been a kosher meal because Peter never ate anything that wasn't kosher. Simon the Tanner, his family, they ate kosher food. But you see, Peter now understands, having been through the experience in Acts chapter 10, that the sheet wasn't just about kosher food. God was using the issue of food to teach another lesson. Food fights and circumcision. Two of the main lesson teachers throughout the epistles. And behold, verse 11, Immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. Peter is trying to drive home the point that nothing happens by accident. This is what immediately preceded three men knocking on the door. I'm sitting on the roof, the sheet has been drawn to heaven, I think what in the world was all that about, and the door, there's a knock. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Peter had to make a choice. What was he going to do? He had just heard Jesus speaking to him. He'd resisted Jesus' call three times. It was the Lord who spoke to him out of heaven. Peter recognized the voice of the Lord. That's how he always addressed the Lord Jesus, Lord. Not so, Lord. Now the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, Okay, you just had a lesson. Are you going to be able to apply it? What are we talking about with all these things that we've discussed? We're talking about lessons learned that you can apply in other situations of life. It's not just about the technical business of what kind of food can you eat. It's how are you going to take that lesson and apply it to other circumstances of life. The Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. The Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. When you doubt, you are not walking by faith. When you doubt, 
you are questioning what God has laid out in his word. Peter had to make a choice. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. So now we know that it's not just a couple of other guys, it's six guys. They outnumbered those guys from Caesarea, two to one plus Peter. So if anything happened, two guys could grab one guy and Peter could run. I wasn't alone. There were some other Jews with me. They saw what was going on. They will testify that the story I am giving you is a straight story. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Now that would be pretty hard for him, Cornelius, a Gentile Roman centurion, to guess the name of the guy and the house where the guy is staying. Now, demonic forces can do that. They have communication with one another. So Peter is going to be able to test the waters here. Because when the gospel is preached, which is what Peter does, and he's going to explain that in a minute, when the gospel is preached, that does not encourage demonic forces. That makes them flee. But Peter is a Jew. And Paul explains something very important to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Jews require a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. You remember in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ throughout his ministry, the Jews were always asking him for a sign. And he said, no sign shall be given unto this generation but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. They wanted a sign. When he made the bread, they said, you know, give us a sign. We'd like some more bread. He says, no, you're not seeking after the real bread from heaven. You just want your belly filled. Peter is going to get a sign from God. And as, oh, who shall tell thee, verse 14, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as he began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. It's just like it happened to us. Do you remember what happened on the day of Pentecost? That's at the beginning. Do you remember what happened in Acts chapter 2? There was a sound of the mighty rushing wind. There were tongues of fire. There were foreign languages being spoken. The Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Do you fellows remember what it was like? Remember Peter's in Jerusalem. Where he's giving account here is in Jerusalem. These are people who were in Jerusalem when the day of Pentecost occurred. These were people who were eyewitnesses of what occurred. These are people who saw that Peter was one of the twelve who stood up there and spoke on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. And you know what? God did something that Jesus had promised. Remember, Jesus had told them that the Holy Spirit would bring to their mind whatsoever he had said unto them. He would give them supernatural recall. That's what happens here in the next verse. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, the Holy Spirit is putting things together in Peter's brain. He suddenly make the pieces click together. Like when you've got a puzzle and you're moving the pieces around and suddenly something goes and it fits. 
Here we go all the way back to the beginning of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, at least four years before this. And something that Jesus said pops into Peter's mind. I remembered the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Bong! It clicks. That's what happened in Acts 2. That's what happened in Acts 10. Wow! I don't know if you've ever had a wow moment as you're searching the scriptures. I've had them periodically throughout my life and ministry, and they're always so exciting. I can't sleep. And I sit there and I say, thank you, Lord. I never saw that before. This is so wonderful. This is so exciting to suddenly have things fit together that I've read dozens of times and I never saw it before. That's the scripture. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Bong, here's the conclusion. For as much then... Peter says, based on these facts, based on this evidence, based on these six eyewitnesses, based on what occurred, based on what you know because you were here in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit was given, based on this evidence, for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us. Peter's an apostle. Peter is the chief apostle. Peter is the apostle to the Jews. Peter is the leader. Peter was one of the twelve who was speaking the 18 different languages that are mentioned in Acts chapter 2. He knows the real thing. God gave them the gift, not different, not less, not sort of compromised he gave them the same gift that he gave to us now if you don't believe it ask the six men who just came with me he gave the like gift to the Gentiles too that should tell you something council here at Jerusalem that should tell you something, you who are worried about whether or not I have compromised the truth, whether or not I have entered into deviant practices. I was there at the beginning. I heard what was done. I saw what was done. I participated in what was done. And when I preached the word, God moved on the Gentiles just like he did on the Jews. That's a hard one to refute. That's what Peter says. And notice his next phrase. Who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that they were having an initial blessing and then getting a second blessing. It was not that they were having an emotional ecstatic experience. Peter went in and began to share Christ. And they believed. And the proof that they believed was God brought them in on exactly the same basis as he did the Jews in Acts 2. What had Peter preached in Acts 2? The gospel of Christ, how he died for our sins, was buried and rose again. The Jews believed and suddenly we find the day of Pentecost. Here the Gentiles hear what preached. Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again. The Gentiles believe. And exactly the same thing happened that happened in Acts 2. Who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I? Hey, what was I? That I could withstand God. <laughs> I've had so much pleasant, delightful contact with Jewish people who have those kinds of expressions. <laughs> uh, I suspect... Peter did something like that. What was I? 
that I can withstand God? You know, hey, tell me. Hey, you, tell me. What was I? You and I are nothing. We cannot withstand God. Verse 18, mission accomplished. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Systematic exposition and witness. It's what we have going on here in this chapter. But we need to pick up just a few more principles that will help us to better understand exactly how those underlie this text. Back in verses 1 through 3, we talked about four different principles. We only covered one of them in depth. But as those issues underlie Peter's defense in the text, we need to remember that testing what we do by the Bible in addition to clearing our own conscience is very important. That was the first issue we talked about, the clearing of the conscience. The second issue that we mentioned but did not discuss in detail in Romans 14 is the reason that we do what we do, and we covered that a little earlier tonight. The third key issue is the way a man's or woman's action or non-action or interaction affects the rest of the church. And that is central to what's going on here in Acts chapter 11. The entire Jerusalem church was agitated because of what Peter had done, and yet his answer satisfied the opponents. And then the fourth key issue is how does what we do affect our testimony for the Lord? So as we get to that third area, the one that we haven't really discussed yet, the third main area is the question of stumbling blocks and the restriction of our Christian liberty. Now I touched on that about three weeks ago, but I want to look at a couple of verses that help us understand what is going on in Peter's mind at this point. Now remember in the context of Romans chapter 14, we were talking about the adiaphorous issues, the things that are neither moral nor immoral. Verses 13 and 14. Let's go back and start there for a second because I want to get into verses 15 and following. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Peter is dealing with a very delicate issue in Jerusalem. It would seem that what Peter has done has put a stumbling block in the way of one of his brothers. It would seem that Peter, rather than restricting his liberty to do something, has actually caused a weaker brother to stumble. So how do we put those things together? Well, let me read verse 14. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now, I think it was the mercy of the Lord that Peter didn't actually rise and kill and eat one of the animals out of that sheep. <clears throat> that would have immediately cut off the greater purpose of God giving him that vision. It also helps to settle the agitation about the issue of kosher foods up front. Because clearly the stuff in Cornelius' house was not kosher food. But he didn't kill anything out of that humongous mass of unclean animals. So as we move through Romans 14, we are seeing the underlying issue of what happens in Acts 11. And by the way, let me just point it out again, the passage is not a discussion of sexual sin, which is always unclean, and which God says must always be judged and repudiated. It's a discussion of food. Verse 15 and following. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, that's food, now walkest thou not charitably. Now, Peter, were you not walking charitably? When you went into Cornelius, didn't you stop and think about all those brothers back there in Jerusalem? 
Were you not walking charitably because you had brothers in Jerusalem who were clearly grieved with the food you ate in Cornelius' household? Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. You see, that's why Peter answers the way that he does in Acts chapter 11. His goal was not just to flatten them. His goal was not just to say, look guys, you're wrong, and you've got to learn to live with it. So, take a deep breath, and I hope you pass out. <laughs> Peter didn't do that. The reason Peter answered as he did was because his desire was to obey God but not to destroy the brothers in the same act. That's walking a very fine line, folks. Can you apply it? Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Had Peter done a good thing in Acts chapter 11? Yes, he had. He had obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ. He had been the, the key to the door that unlocked the door for the Gentiles. He had given testimony for Christ. He had presented a clear gospel. But yet suddenly there are those who are questioning it. Verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. By the end of Peter's speech, do we have righteousness? Yes. Do we have peace? Yes. Do we have joy in the Holy Ghost? Yes. Then hath God granted repentance unto the Gentiles. <laughs> you see, the Apostle Paul is following through with principles that we see Peter living out in his life in Acts chapter 11. Now, unfortunately, people tend to focus on external things rather than on the internal issues of substance. Paul goes on in verse 18, Romans 14. We're still in Romans 14. For he that in these things serveth Christ, that is righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost, he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. So what are the things we're supposed to focus on? We're supposed to focus on righteousness. We're supposed to focus on peace. We're supposed to focus on joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. You see, that had been Peter's focus. And in the end, he was acceptable to God. And in the end, though they had questioned, in the end, he was approved of men. You see, God's not merely looking for conformity to the letter of the law, but he's looking for conformity to the spirit of the law, which always goes beyond the letter of the law. Verse 19, general principle, practical application. He's been talking about food, and now here is the principle. Remember, we told you that's how to read Paul. Let us, therefore, when you see a therefore, ask yourself, what's it there for? It's because he's summarizing something very important that he's been using a specific illustration to demonstrate. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. That should be our goal. That is a general principle of the word of God. and <laughs> God used food to teach us that principle. Do you really seek the peace and the purity of the church? Yes, there needs to be purity. That's where you take a stand on a moral or a doctrinal issue. Something that is significantly clear in the word of God. That's the purity of the church. We're all for the purity of the church. But do you also seek the peace of the church? You see, that's absolutely essential too. And that's what Paul says, general principle, Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify another. And that is really the solution to almost every neutral problem or division in the body of Christ. Verse 20. For meat destroy not the work of God. 
All things are indeed pure, but it is evil for the man who eateth with offense. In other words, he's got a conscience over that. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. If you've got a twinge of conscience about it, you better avoid it. But don't cause a weaker brother to stumble just because you don't have a twinge of conscience about it. As a powerful principle that applies to all the areas of the Christian life, everything we do must be an act of faith. Remember what Peter heard from the Holy Spirit? Go with these guys, nothing doubting. Everything that we do in our Christian life must be an act of faith. As you go through every day making decisions, and we all make thousands of decisions every day, is it an act of faith? Easiest one perhaps to illustrate is one that you hear me saying often. Is you're in your car, you're late for some place, and so you edge the speedometer just a little bit higher. And all of a sudden you're having an argument with your conscience. Well, I know that's what the sign said, but the road is clear, and it's a straight road, and there's, there's no cars on the road, and it's a 16-lane highway, and they're telling me to go 25, and, you know, if I go 25, I'm going to be five minutes late to work, and so I'll just push it up to 30. Is that an act of faith? No, your conscience has given you a twinge, and if you sear it often enough, you'll no longer feel it. But it is still sin. The summary principle of which we test all things that we do, which are not clearly stated to be right or wrong, sin or righteousness, required or prohibited. It is not the final principle for plowing over things that the Bible declares to be right or wrong. When you have that business of an act of faith, there are Christians who try to say, well, I know the Bible prohibited this, but I took a step of faith anyway. Listen, it is never a step of faith to disobey the word of God. That goes for moral things, especially. I took a step of faith and married an unbeliever that they would come to Christ. No, God said, be not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. That is not an act of faith. So this test is for things that are neither declared right nor wrong. Verse 23. He that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith. You see, he hasn't left his illustration, but he's giving us general principles as we move through the text that take us back to Acts chapter 11. Last phrase of verse 23. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The action in itself may be neutral, but if you don't take that action in faith, you have just committed sin. That's a pretty clear statement of doctrinal truth that Paul is giving to us in verse 23. So, on the food issue, make sure that whatever position you take, because it is in itself a neutral issue, make sure that it is an act of faith, not an act of doubt. And that, of course, applied to circumcision before, as we saw. The second major passage giving the controlling principles is in 1 Corinthians 8. We read a portion of that. But let me read some selected verses again, now that we've learned the controlling principles. Just picking up verse 1, verse 4, verse 7. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. So this is food that's been offered to an idol. Knowledge puffeth up. How many people 
that you know who have a little bit of theology have fat heads about it. That's something that I struggle with. Well, I know more than he does, so, you know, I don't have to listen to him. I ran into it with a lot of classmates when I was in seminary. Oh, it was the basis for many, many, many late night arguments. And seminary students just love to do that. We know that we all have knowledge. But you know what knowledge does if it's not balanced? Knowledge puffeth up. So, <laughs> like the sound of air escaping a balloon. That's what knowledge does. Hot air puffs you up. Makes you proud, makes you arrogant, makes you stick your nose in the air. Now we're supposed to have knowledge, but it is supposed to be balanced by the second half of the verse. But charity edifieth. We have that word in the English language which expresses the underlying Greek word. This is an edifice. It is a building. It is something that has been built up. It's not held up by hot air. It is a building that has been built up. And that's what Paul says that we as believers are supposed to be doing with one another. We are supposed to be building one another up. If you love the brothers and sisters, you will edify them. You will build them up. What was Peter doing in Acts chapter 11? Why was he giving them all the facts? Because you see, without all the facts, people come to wrong conclusions. Peter loved them and he didn't just push his way in and say, look, I'm in charge here, quit belly aching, and just sit down and be quiet. He gave them all the facts. He loved them. And love edifies the brethren. Down to verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, that's back to the issue of kosher foods again, we know that an idol is nothing in this world and that there is none other God but one. So we don't have to fight between the different gods whom we like better, like the Greeks did. Well, I think I like Zeus best. Well, I like Mercury. Well, I happen to like uh, Diana of the Ephesians. You know, we don't have to do that. There's only one God. Everything else is phony baloney. We know that. You know something? That's an issue of knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. The idol is nothing in the world. We know that. We know that there is none other God but one. We know that. He's using the word. We know. These are things we know. But if you don't have a balance to that, even though that's correct theology, you're going to destroy the body of Christ not build it up. Verse 7. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. Remember he started in verse 1 contrasting knowledge and charity. So we're going to deal with the issue of knowledge. You might have knowledge, but there might be a brother or sister who doesn't have knowledge. So how are you going to be able to deal with that brother or sister? Yes, you want to teach them. Yes, they need to learn the knowledge. But the way that is going to make it smooth is charity. That's what will build up the body of Christ. Charity is the word agape. That's the word for God's kind of love. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. Oh, our time is up. But some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto the idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. The issue of conscience again. But here it's not your conscience. It's the conscience of somebody you're dealing with. Either you are going to stand on your rights because you know something, or you are going to love the brethren and be willing to restrict your rights. Our time is up. We can't go on, but uh, the Lord willing, we'll pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word. It's powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. 
How we thank you that you use these illustrations in Scripture because they're something everybody can understand. And then from there you springboard us into the doctrinal application in many, many, many areas of the Christian life. Thank you, Father. Help us to learn the lessons well. As Peter learned the lesson and suddenly things clicked into place, he saw the sheet from heaven and suddenly there's a knock at the door. And suddenly things click into place. And then he goes and preaches. And suddenly other things click into place from Acts chapter 2. And then remembered I the word of the Lord. Help us to learn to walk by faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And as we walk by faith, suddenly things begin to drop into place. Because that's the way you have ordained it. Please, Father, take your word and use it as it has gone forth tonight to the glory of Jesus Christ, to the edification of believers, to the salvation of the lost, to the testimony of Christ in this church, in this community, and around the world, as you work in and through each and every one of us to the glory of your Son, our Savior. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.